Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and specifically welcome to Spiritual Friends Sangha and our Monday Mindfulness Gathering. I'm Augusta Hopkins, and I'll be your host for the evening. Today is the first Monday of the month, and our custom at this Sangha and many Palm Village Sanghas in the Bay Area is to recite the five mindfulness trainings on the first gathering of the month. And we recite the five mindfulness trainings sometimes, and sometimes we recite half of the 14 mindfulness trainings, and then sometimes we recite the trainings offered by Arise, which is a sangha that was born almost 10 years ago and now, awakening through race, intersectionality, and social equity. Today is the five mindfulness trainings. And the I'm going to talk a little bit. There were so many wonderful things shared. I want to speak to that a little bit. And then we'll enjoy meditating. And then we'll share the five mindfulness trainings. And in the future, I'm exploring also bring in some chanting, some Theravada chanting. And Walt has a link for the Theravada chanting, but we don't have the printout. So we'll wait until next month for that first link from Watson Mok. And we'll just do the Plum Village stuff today. Yeah. Oh my God. Life, right? Like it keeps coming. As Shannon shared, uh, the compose, the way I heard it anyway, I'm not sure exactly what their language was at this moment in time, but as Shannon shared this compulsive technology and so many of us, myself included, if I go into social media, it just sucks me in, just sucks me in. Email does it bad enough. And so I, I have several social media accounts. I do not use any of them because they make me miserable, miserable. And I check it and I watch and I notice, like I check my heart mind. I notice, oh yeah, even that little bit, oh, no, nope, I'm miserable. And so I just encourage you to keep checking for yourself, like to notice, have your quote unquote right relationship with it. Like, you know, not right as in correct, but right as in upright or wise. If you look at the Eightfold Path of the Buddha laid forth, the word that's offered with like right speech or right mindfulness or right action, right concentration, right effort, which is the thing we'll get to in a second. <laughs> right action, right livelihood, all of the eight, eight limbs, that word that gets translated as right, it's just samba. It's like kind of like, you can think of it as great or wise or profound, or you can translate it so many ways. It's my holding from Ajahn Amaro that it's right, like riding a ship. I love that holding of it, riding a ship. You know, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity and privilege to do any sailing, but on a sailboat, you know, it like it, it goes all the way over to both sides often. And like, that's okay. But sometimes it goes too far over and you need to write it. You need to like get it back. And if you've kayaked or you spend any time in a canoe or a raft or even like an inner tube, right? it flips over and then you flip it back. You just write it. It's no big deal. It's just what you do. It's how you take care of it. I don't know if you think about it on a surfboard either, you know, like sometimes you get tossed and then you get the board back up and you get back on the board. I don't think we language is writing the board, but like, that's the thing. And that's the term that's used with sailing is as you write it. And Ajahn Amro offered that way to hold that word. And that's been really helpful for me because we, I don't know about you, but I can get so caught in like right and wrong and good and bad. And by doing it right and want to put in all the effort and like get it all figured out and dialed in and, Makes me miserable. I still do it sometimes, but less. Thank God. I do it a little bit less. And so we notice as Shannon, like, oh, there I am. I'm caught. It's pulling me in. I heard the word compulsive. And that's been helpful for me. And then Jimmy named like compulsive eating. I'm going to try to stop naming you because maybe all names that you didn't want to be shared publicly, but I'm sure he's okay with that. You know, compulsive eating, or I, I'm pretty sure. I got a smile, I think. Great. Like compulsive eating. We can get compulsive about anything, even wholesome things. But right? it's useful to eat, right? It's very beneficial. It's also beneficial to stop and listen to bells when they arise.
in the Plum Village tradition, we enjoy bells of mindfulness. And I know those of you on Zoom land and those of you listening to the recording, you didn't get to hear the bells because they don't get transmitted. So that's an invitation to come in next week and get to hear the bells live. But we're right next to a church and the church chimes a half hour and the hour. So we get to practice live here with bells. At Plum Village, there are bells throughout to summon you for different things. And in the dining halls, in all the dining halls, there are bells that chime the hour and the half hour because that's a big gathering place and people can fall into our regular habits around eating. And the bells bring us home to ourselves. There's a gata, a short poem. Listen, listen. The sound of this bell brings me back to my true home. Like, can we just allow the bell to bring us back to our true home? That true home being mindfulness, awareness. Sada Utejaniya says, go back home where you belong. Awareness is your true home. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I can get pulled out there. Like, how are you doing? How are they doing? How's she doing? How's he doing? What's going on? And like, that's not in here. That's not somewhere that I have any agency. And mostly I don't have responsibility either. But this one, this place, I have some agency here. And I have some responsibility, right? It's like, oh yes, dinner, eat first. Okay, take care of myself so that I have something to offer. And bells of mindfulness can be the church bells. They can be the bells that we'll be inviting later in our gathering. They can be um, someone else's cell phone that just kind of happened to go off. They can be your own text alert if you have an alert like that, or if actually someone makes a phone call. There's another poem about answering the telephone, taking three breaths before you answer the telephone and saying like, you know, your words are traveling thousands of miles. May you be present to your words as you're hearing them and offering them. We use a lot of small poems in the Plum Village tradition to help us in our practice as a support, again, not as a mandate. Hmm, so compulsion. I have noticed that I can allow habits of compulsive behavior to be bells of mindfulness. Oh, there I am engaging in that habit, getting sucked in to that thing. And Matthew Brensilver, an insight teacher in the area years ago, I remember him saying he had downgraded from a smartphone to a flip phone because the smartphone is way more powerful than him. Like he can't be mindful with the smartphone. It's too, I'll use the word fancy for the moment, but like it's too fancy. And I didn't, I saw him recently. I didn't ask him if he's still using a flip phone, but like, what a great idea. I'm not bigger and stronger than that smartphone. If you watch the documentary in Inconvenient Truth, they spell it out so clearly, right? So much money and so many wise brains are going into sucking us into that black mirror, right? Like that's that's the point of it. So I'm not bigger than that. You know, I'm not stronger than that, but I can notice. And I've set up some things to support me. So I don't have any alerts come in except for a phone call and a text message. And I have my phone on, black, on my, my screen. I do use a, an iPhone. I have it on black and white. And I have as few apps on it as I can manage. And I have it on Do Not Disturb most of the time. And when I go to bed, I put it onto airplane mode and I put it not near my bed. Because if it's near my bed, I get on it earlier than I want to. Even though it's not what I want to do, right? It just it is what happens, right? So we can notice these compulsive behaviors, these compulsions that show up. I also notice a compulsive behavior in, my, in myself of blaming other people, right? I don't feel, well, it's your fault. It's your fault. Delusion, delusion. Oh, I don't feel well. Oh, have you had enough to eat? Are you thirsty? Maybe you're hot. Maybe you're tired, right? Like so much fun in Stern Grove, right? Like it's so fabulous to go to Stern Grove. And it can be exhausting. I was on retreat recently. Amazing to be on retreat. Love it. I'm going to come back tired. We need to rest. We need both. We need various forms of nourishment and nutrients. Various forms. Hmm. Yeah. 
And I want to keep ripping on, on the things that y'all said, and I'll try to close with this one thing that I think can include at least three of the sharings. And that's about nature, whether it's Fernal Hill or the ocean or near woods or any other form of nature stern grove is also tons of trees, right? It's so nourishing to be in nature. And we don't always have the opportunity. We don't always have the privilege to be able to spend time in nature. We're not close to nature or we have to work. We have other responsibilities. Our bodies don't allow us to be in nature. Other things show up and we can notice nature wherever we are. Another insight teacher here in the Bay Area, Anushka Fernanda Pole, at the close of retreat, I sat a month long with her last March, a, a crew of teachers, but she offered, they offered at the end, I'm not sure what pronouns Anushka is using, so I'll offer they as a placeholder for not knowing. Spend time in nature, find nature. You know, maybe it's a patch of grass. Right here in San Francisco, there are poppies in the middle of the street. You know, a teacher of mine, Joanne Rosen, years ago, she encouraged me, notice those weeds who are making their way through the crack. They are strong. They are resilient. They're making their way up through that concrete. Notice them. Feel strength from them. We have redwoods in the middle of the city. Plenty of oaks. Like you can touch nature. Or a bee, or an ant, or a cockroach, or a silverfish, a butterfly, or a moth, a fruit fly. Like this is nature. And you are nature. We are nature. We can touch it. When we remember, if we allow ourselves to attune our minds in that direction. And the wind and the sun, they are nature. And water is nature and you're drinking water. Yeah. And then when we're in like what we call nature, whether it's Bernal Hill or Muir Woods or in the water, surfing or swimming or whatever. Soak it in, right? Like I love that you gave yourself some more time there. And I love that you listened to your heart and got inspired. Like you go where you feel called. When we're really in ourselves and we can go where we feel called, it usually works out. It's kind of cool. It's like we drop the stories and the shoulds and the supposeds and the mentors and all that stuff. It's like, oh, over here. Oh, and over here. And to give ourselves to it. The last thing that arises in my mind at the moment is again at the close of the retreat recently with Matthew Brunsilver. He offered from Gil Fransdale, another insight teacher in the Bay Area, that humans generally, most of us, fidget our way from birth to death. We fidget our way from birth to death. And so when I speak of listening to your heart and going where you feel called, I'm not talking about fidgeting. I'm talking about listening in and going there, doing that, giving yourself to that. And it could be as simple as going to the bathroom. Like, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. Like, feel yourself walking to the toilet. Feel yourself doing whatever you need to do in there. Be there. Do it. Don't sit down and get on your fucking phone. That's a waste. It doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do anybody any good. Like, be there. Do that thing. And then go and do the next thing. With, with your fullness. With your presence. With your suchness, with your tathagata ness. You know, the tathagata, the tathagata, the awakened one, the suchness, the fullness, it's in you. It's not just Siddhartha Gautama, right? It's in you. It's the potential in all of us to awaken. All right. So let's do a little bit of that sitting that's so helpful for our journey of awakening, taking a moment to find a comfortable posture that might involve a little bit of movement or stretching, or maybe you've already arrived in a comfortable posture and you're landed and settled. Wonderful. Enjoy that. Those of you who are supported by moving a little bit, enjoy that. It's helpful to remember that the practice of meditation is available in any posture. 
So we can practice in a formal way with the four traditional postures of sitting, standing, lying down, and walking. I'm a big fan of walking practice. And my formal practice, my own personal formal practice is in a lying down posture. That's how I practice on my own at home and on retreat for many years now. I find it very supportive for this ease, for this rest and settling, for bringing in a little less effort, you know, L letting the type A-ness go and just like dropping in and resting into the earth and resting with the body. In the Plum Village tradition, we have a formal practice of lying down meditation with my, my friend and colleague, my son, his sister, uh, Vinette Cook, offered here at Spiritual Friends Monday nights a couple of weeks ago while I was on retreat, lying down. It's amazing. And if you're interested in exploring that and you're falling asleep, let me know and I'll help you out with posture stuff. Then sitting is much more commonly practiced in the West. Of like that's how you meditate is sitting. So finding your seated posture of that supports you. And then standing is great. Standing meditation. So many things about standing practice that I love. One, not in order of my love of them or priority at all, but one, you can do it anytime, anywhere. If your body is able to stand. If you happen to have that privilege and ability, ableness to stand, you can stand anywhere. And that helps your heart, mind, and body to recognize, oh, I can meditate anywhere. And we stop waiting. Waiting becomes no longer a part of our lives because we're not waiting. We're not waiting for the bus or waiting to check out at the grocery store or waiting in line for something else or standing, waiting in line for food on meditation retreats. We're not waiting, we're standing and we're being just as we might be sitting or lying down, or walking, we're present in ourselves. So I invite you, whatever posture you might be in, to come into presence with yourself. Noticing what happens with that invitation. Does the mind show up? How do I do that? What does she mean? Okay, hi there, mind. I got you. Come into presence with yourself. What happens in the body? The mind gets a little vacation for these 30 minutes. The mind gets to rest. Profound rest. What happens in the body when I invite you to come into presence with yourself? Maybe you feel an emotion in the heart, grief or tenderness or joy, anger, or fear. Oh, hi, my dear friend. Hi, my dear friend. Thich Nhat Hanh taught us so clearly. Hi, my dear, I see you. Hi, my dear friend, invited for tea. You find your own way, but I love the language I received from Thai. I heard offered here this evening from one of you is to notice, oh, this emotion, whatever it is, well, it's present. Fear is present. Tiredness is present. Grief is present. Anger is present. Joy is present. Oh, it's present. Hi. For it arises and passes, it is conditioned. The shift from I am sad or I am angry to, oh, sadness is here, sadness has arisen. 
Anger has arisen. Fear is showing itself. Oh, hi there. We get a little space from it and we recognize, oh, I am not my anger. I am not my fear. I am not my sadness. They're just heart states, mind states that arise and pass. Like all dharma, that's dharma with a lowercase t, like all conditioned experience. It all arises and passes. Moment by moment, that's how it is. And we greet it. Hi there. And feel it in the body. Maybe a tightening of the heart or a bracing of the muscles. Maybe a temperature. And joy too. These more pleasant heart states, mind states can also be felt in the body. Tingling, pulsing, flow, warmth and alertness. They're all worthy of our attention, pleasant or unpleasant. Hi there. Present moments by present moments. We can become attuned to ourselves. And when we choose to stand for practice, there's a built-in alertness that's available in a way that isn't necessarily immediately available for sitting, walking, or lying down. There's this wakefulness that's right there because we're standing, we're upright, upright. Yeah, that same upright. Of the eight limbs of the Eightfold Path, we are upright. Standing strong and stable, feeling our weight dispersed among both feet, maybe even feeling to the tripods of the feet, the heels, the ball of the foot, the big toe side and the pinky toe side. So we've got those six points, three on each foot over which our weight is distributed evenly. And for me, when I come into standing practice, I shift my weight around a little bit. A little forward, a little back, a little side to side to find center. It's a lot like focusing the camera, manual camera or binoculars or old school radio station. You got to go from both sides to find the sweet spot. A little off balance in order to find balance. And rooting down through the feet and the seat for those of us who are seated or lying down, rooting down, feeling that contact with the earth and lifting up to the sky, lengthening the body out if we're lying down, up if we're standing, sitting, or walking up toward the sky. And we're held, held by the hug of gravity, held to the earth. And we're lifted up to the skies, to the full moon in Capricorn, to the sun, to the stars. Lifted up, allowing the heart to be boogied, the shoulders broadening. And we attune to ourselves. Hi there, how you doing? What's going on? Checking in with our own experience. Open heart. Gentle. Hi, I got you. Feeling into the body. How you doing? What's going on in there? Is down into the body, into the gut, into the heart, not the mind. Let the mind rest. Showing up for yourself. This precious gift of practice and community. Freely offered. Hi, I got you. 
are you doing? Mm -hmm. Finding the balance of alertness and ease. Resting into an open awareness, if that's available to you, just resting, noticing arising and passing experience through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Conditioned experience arising and passing, observing. Anicca, impermanence. And maybe particularly attuning to the dissolution of fading away, maybe. And if that's not feeling supportive right now, allowing attention to rest onto your chosen object of awareness. It might be the experience of the body resting. That's my favorite object. I'm going to practice with an object these last several years. The experience of the body Resting. Or maybe you're supported today by something more tactile or tangible, like the feeling in the hands or the feet. Or the sensation of breath in the body nostrils, the chest, the low belly. Or awareness of sound specifically, focusing on sound arising and passing might support you. Choosing your path of practice. For these next 20 minutes or so. And sticking with it. And not dancing around from one to the other. It's good enough. Whichever path you choose is the path for this short 20 minute practice period. And if you're sleepy, you might be supported to bring attention to the inhalation in the nostrils, specifically attuning to the in-breath that brings in wakefulness. And if the mind is busy, and you can simply rest into awareness of the body, I would encourage that. And if that doesn't hold attention sufficiently with that busy, busy mind, resting into the experience of the exhalation can be very helpful. You might need to count them to give the mind something to do. You can count backwards from 10 again and again. And of course you'll lose your place. You'll probably just start over again. You need to get all the way to one. You start over again, like no big deal just as something to give the mind to do. Please enjoy, enjoy. And those of you who are in the space, enjoy these three bells to support a greater settling in. And in 20 minutes, we'll give you two bells to bring us out. A little wake up sounds, let you and the bell know that I'm gonna invite the bell to sound. And then three full invitations of the bell. Please enjoy riding in the waves of the bell.
Awareness is your true home. Come back home where you belong. Sounds come and sounds go. My mind is a clear blue sky. What are you aware of? Simply noticing what you are aware of, right? Not answering the question. The mind's a little vacay. Tuning into the heart, the gut. The sensory experience of this body in the present moment, moment by moment.
bringing awareness to the experience of hearing as the bell arises and passes, as the sound of the bell arises as passes, really hearing the full sound arising and fading away. And when you can no longer hear the bell, gradually, gradually expanding the field of awareness into the realm of movement. As you continue to listen into this body and discern what it might be, giving yourself care and attention, tender love and care, a little TLC. As you bring in movement, self-massage, continuing this practice of attunement, of tuning into the wisdom of your own heart, mind, and body, caring for yourself just as you are. And when it feels right, expanding the field of awareness to include light and whatever level of sight you have. Mm. And coming back to the circle S feels good for you. If that means turning your camera on, that's awesome. If it doesn't, that's just fine it's just fine and we're going to read the five mindfulness trains together i'll start us off and then we'll be able to hear five or maybe six different voices depending on how we go and i wonder if on zoom any of you would like to share your voice well we'll share a link with you where you can find the trainings there will be some introductory words and then each of the five trainings. So by a physical show of hand, anyone interested in reading from Zoom land? Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. So we'll get to hear Diane's voice as well. Um, Diane, do you think you would rather read true happiness or true love? The second or third mindfulness training. Hmm. You can't unmute because you don't have permission. We'll see what happens when we get that far along. Okay, great. I understand you very clearly. Okay, so I'll pass out all of them. And when we get to two or three, maybe we'll go on to Zoom and maybe... We won't. Lisa, can you help me? I have to give you two more pieces of paper. Thank you. Well, I guess I can. Can you reach? Yeah. You keep one and then give one to Tom. Okay, so we'll just offer from here. Thank you for your willingness, Diane. Maybe next time we'll will be more dialed in. Great. So these are the five mindfulness trainings and they're you know, a beautiful Plum Village adaptation of the basic five precepts that you'll see in all traditions of Buddhism. More words, more dialed in to presentness. And this particular iteration of the trainings that we're going to read tonight, they were revised in June of last year. These are a living, breathing document. They're born 2,600 years ago. Like, you know, they got some roots and we keep them alive by practicing with them and playing with them. And so I invite you, there'll be a link to these in the YouTube post also, so you can download them for yourself. You can print them out or make them editable and change it. 
you know, make it alive for you. If there's something that doesn't land, like cross it out, you know, play. How, how does this resonate for you? And you might choose to practice with one or five of them in your life. Like as a North Star is a guiding means, how to upright that ship, right? Not, not because, not to get off the whip and beat ourselves up. That's not what it's about. So here we go. So the five mindfulness trainings revised June, 2022, offered by the Plum Village Community of Engaged Buddhism. The five mindfulness trainings are one of the most concrete ways to practice mindfulness. They are non-sectarian and their nature is universal. They are true practices of compassion and understanding. All spiritual traditions have the equivalent, have their own equivalent of the five mindfulness trainings. The first training is to protect life, to decrease violence in oneself, in the family and in society. The second training is to practice social justice, generosity, not stealing and not exploiting other living beings, not exploiting the earth either. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote a whole book, The Earth, My Mother. I think that's the title of it. Love Letters to Mother Earth, maybe is the title, actually. It's like, yes, we've, we've depleted her, right? There's been raping and pillaging for a long time, and she has not been free from that. Continue this mining and loss of waste, right? So to protect all living, all living things, including this earth, which is alive, right? The third mindfulness training is the practice of responsible sexual behavior. And you get to decide what's, what's responsible sexual behavior for you and your community. Like you're in choice, your choice. Responsible sexual behavior in order to protect individuals, love groups, couples, families, children, in order to protect all beings. The fourth is the practice of deep listening and loving speech to restore communication and reconciliation. The fifth is about mindful consumption, whether that's technology or, or food or you know whatever it might be. The fifth is about mindful consumption to help us not bring toxins and poisons into our body or mind. The five mindfulness trainings are based on the precepts developed during the time of the Buddha to be the foundation of practice for the entire lay practice community. Thich Nhat Hanh writes, I have translated these precepts for modern times because mindfulness is at the foundation of each one of them. With mindfulness, we are aware of what is going on in our bodies. With mindfulness, we are aware of what is going on in our feelings. With mindfulness, we are aware of what is going on in our minds. With mindfulness, we are aware of what's going on in the world. And because this mindfulness is alive in us, more often than without it, we avoid doing harm to ourselves and others. Mindfulness protects us. Mindfulness protects our families. Mindfulness protects our society. When we are mindful, we can see that by refraining from doing one thing, we prevent another thing from happening. We really notice and experience that interconnectedness. We arrive at our own unique insight. Through the practice, we arrive at our own unique insight. It is not something imposed on us by an outside authority. These mindfulness trains are not imposed on us. They're offered as a means of practice, but we want to pick them up, you know, play with them, find out, is this important for me? Practicing the mindfulness trains therefore helps us to be more calm, calm and concentrated and brings more insight and enlightenment. And more on these trainings can be found in Take On Ham's book, Happiness. Essential Mindfulness Practices. These then are the five mindfulness trainings. The five mindfulness trainings represent the Buddhist vision for global spirituality and ethic. They are a concrete expression of the Buddha's teachings on the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path, the path of upright understanding and true love, leading to healing, 
transformation and happiness for ourselves and for the world. To practice the five mindfulness trainings is to cultivate the insight of interbeing or right view, wise view, upright view, which can remove all discrimination, intolerance, anger, fear, and despair. If we live according to the five mindfulness trainings, we are already on the path of a bodhisattva. Knowing we're on that path, we are not lost in confusion about our life in the present or in fears about the future. So we'll enjoy hearing our voices beginning with our first mindfulness training, just going in order. Take your time, space between the words, really let it percolate in your own heart, mind, and body. And then once there's a bit of a pause, I'll invite the bell. You can enjoy the bell. Those of you who can hear it. And then the next person can begin who has the next training. Taking three breaths before you start. Reverence for life. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I am committed to cultivating the insight of interview and compassion and learning ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I am determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to to support any acts of killing in the world, in my thinking, or in my way of life. Seeing that harmful actions arise from anger, fear, greed, and intolerance, which in turn come from dualistic and discriminative thinking, I will cultivate openness, non discrimination and non-attachment to you in order to transform violence, fanaticism, and dogmatism in myself and in the world. The second mindfulness training, true happiness. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing, and oppression, I am committed to practicing generosity in my thinking, speaking, and acting. I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. Now we share my time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. I will practice looking deeply to see that the happiness and suffering of others are not separate from my own happiness and suffering. That true happiness is not possible without understanding and compassion. And are running after wealth, pain, power, and sensual pleasures can bring much suffering and despair. I am aware that happiness depends on my mental attitude and not on external conditions. And that I can be happy in the present moment simply by remembering but I already have more than enough conditions to be happy. 
I am committed to practicing right livelihood so that I can help reduce the suffering of living beings on Earth and stop contributing to climate change. Diane, would you like to read? Is that going to work or shall we do it here? Maybe in the room, that's probably more convenient for you. It's not more convenient for me. It's up to you. Would you like to read this mindfulness training on true love? Um, maybe someone else should. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. The third mindfulness training, true love. Aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct, I'm committed to cultivating responsibility and learning ways to protect the safety and integrity of individuals, couples, families, and society. Knowing that sexual desire <coughs> is not bad, and that sexual activity motivated by craving always harmed myself as well as others. I'm determined not to engage in sexual relations without mutual consent, true love, and a deep long term commitment. I resolve to find spiritual support for the integrity of my relationship with family members, friends, and Sangha with whom there is support and trust. I will do everything in my power to protect children from sexual abuse and to protect to prevent couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. Seeing that body and mind are interrelated, I'm committed to learn appropriate ways to take care of my sexual energy and to cultivate the four basic elements of true love loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness for the greater happiness of myself and others. Recognizing the diversity of human experience, I'm committed not to discriminate against any form of gender identity or sexual orientation. Practicing true love, we know that we will continue beautiful into the future. Knowing that the rest can create happiness or suffering, I am committed to speaking truthfully, using words that inspire confidence, joy, and hope. When anger is manifesting to me, I am determined not to speak. I will practice mindful breathing and walking in order to recognize and to not be faithful to my anger. I know that the roots of anger can be caused by a lot of assumption, 
in the back of the standing room, probably start thinking myself and in the other person. I will speak and listen in the way that you talk my dog and the other person to control the suffering and see the way out of a difficult situation. I am determined not to spread news that I do not know to be certain and not to utter words that can cause the vision of the soul. I will practice right ability to nourish my capacity for understanding, love, joy, and peacefulness. And I gradually transform anger, violence, and fear for life and my purpose. The fifth mindfulness training, nourishment and healing. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption, I am committed to cultivating good health, both physical and mental, for myself, my family, and my society, by practicing mindful eating, drinking, and consuming. I will practice looking deeply into how I consume the four kinds of nutrients, namely edible foods, sense impressions, volitions, volition, and consciousness. I am determined not to gamble or to use alcohol, drugs, or any other products which contain toxins, such as certain websites, electronic games, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. I will practice coming back to the present moment to be in touch with a refreshing, healing, and nourishing elements in me and around me. Not letting regrets and sorrow drag me back into the past, nor letting anxieties, fear, or craving pull me out of the present moment. I am determined not to try to cover up loneliness, anxiety, or other suffering by losing myself in consumption. I will contemplate interbeing and consume in a way that preserves peace, joy, and well-being in my body and consciousness and in the collective body and consciousness of my family, my society, and the earth. Thank you all. Thank you for your voices. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the screen share. 
by reciting these trainings together, we support each other. It's a practice, right? It's wonderful to have a Sangha of two with our partner. And then there's a different magic that comes together with a room of would-be strangers to feel our interconnection, to feel the interconnectedness. And, you know, in the United States, tomorrow is Independence Day, 4th of July. And we have the possibility we can celebrate interdependence, interdependence day. And similar languaging for interdependence is interconnection. Thich Nhat Hanh offers a language of interbeing, right? Interdependence, we inter are. We cannot exist without each other. We cannot exist without the earth. We cannot exist without the rain, without the sun. And we cannot have joy without sorrow. Turns out, turns out. And I appreciate the naming of, of, um, of Plum Village and the silly songs that we sing at the various Plum Village practice centers. I wanted to close us out this evening with a, one of those silly songs. I am not a singer. I went to performing arts school growing up and had to be in the choir. I, was, I performed well in dance and in the theater. Wasn't great with the instruments, but I was required to be in the choir. And the teacher said to me, Gussie, you just mouth the words. Like I just had to stand there and mouth the words. It was ridiculous. <laughs> but the thing was like that moment in time, like, I remember her saying to me like so clearly, like, I already knew. I was already mouthing the words. So someone else whose voice was off. <laughs> but the Plum Village tradition has allowed me to embrace that. And it's like, it's not about being a good singer. It's about sharing our hearts and, and song can can uplift the spirit. Resma Menicum, uh, amazing somatic experiencing practitioner and licensed clinical social worker. He's worked in Afghanistan, helping people to get a clue and kind of like settle into themselves, armed services specifically. He teaches us that harmonizing our voices, whether it's in song or humming or buzzing or like in yoga, the oming, it, it brings us together as a resonance that's created. And so again, those of you who are on Zoom, please, please play along. And if you're feeling like you're up for turning your cameras on for a few minutes, that would be great. And we'll do a call and response and you'll get the gist. You maybe can sing better than me. Great, sing better than me. No problem, but it, it's pretty simple. And we'll sing it twice through call and response and maybe we'll sing it once together and, and then we'll say goodbye. Hmm. We're all move. We're all moving. We're all moving. We are. We are all moving. We're all moving. We're all moving on a journey to nowhere. On a journey to nowhere. Taking it easy. Taking it easy. Taking it slow. Taking it slow. No more worries. No more worries. No need to hurry. No need to hurry. Nothing to carry. Nothing to carry. Let it all go. 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 All right, here we go. Second time. I want you singing at home. No one can hear you. <laughs> We're all moving. We're all moving. On a journey to nowhere. On a journey to nowhere. Nothing to carry. Nothing to carry. Let it all go. 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 Yay. Yay. <laughs> right? And I missed a part the second time around. And like, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Not having to be perfect. Not having to do it right. There's so much freedom in that. Yeah. So thank you so much for your practice this evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you familiar faces and new faces it's really wonderful and i love the technology can allow us to be together even when we're distant physically from one another and yet technology is rough sucks us in and gives us all kinds of false information and it's it can be a support too so what a gift what a gift and 
it's a gift to be able to offer the Dharma and to be able to offer it to you. It's only possible because you're here. So thank you so much for being present. You make this Sangha possible. And if you have the capacity, if you have the means, and if your heart is inclined to offer financial donations to San Francisco Dharma Collective, some will go to the center, some will come to me. It's really appreciated. And if it's not what's in your means, no problem. No problem. This is freely offered by the collective, by me. And together, you know, we're creating it. Rent has to be paid, my rent, their rent, like it's a thing. We're in San Francisco, we're in the States, like it costs some money. And like, you know, it's not fee for service. It's a very different model here. And volunteering is quite welcome. The volunteers are what make this possible. I'm here as a volunteer, Walt's here as a volunteer, Tom's here as a volunteer, like that's how it works. So you can sign up over there with Tom. And if you're online and you're able to volunteer and want to volunteer, I think you can get information from Walt or you can find it on the website. And check out the newsletter, which will come out tomorrow, or check out the website to find out all the cool things that are going on. I've been offering a monthly embodied bicycling biking meditation, which has been super fun. And we're going on hiatus now 